Hello, my name is Zach Gibbs, and I am a content developer within Education Services inside Juniper Networks. And today we will be going through the Sky ATP demo part two, Learning Byte. So next, let's go to the monitor workspace. This is probably where you're going to spend most of your time in the Sky ATP web portal. So the first workspace in the monitor workspace is the host workspace. This is going to give you a list of hosts that have downloaded stuff and that information was sent to Sky ATP. So with this, we're going to have a host, the threat level, whether or not it's included in the affected host feed, last activity, CNC hits, malware hits, what policy is being applied, and the state of the investigation. So the first thing I really want to get into detail here is the threat level. You know, that's obviously the big thing. You know, what's the threat level? You can see we have a bunch of hosts here who have a very high threat level, 10 being the max. And you can scroll down and find other hosts. You can see other hosts, for example, at the bottom that have a zero threat level. Now those hosts did download something and the investigation status was set to resolved. And so they're cleared to communicate through the VS or X device again. Now these other hosts, anything that is included in the infected host feed is not allowed to communicate through the SRX. So keep that in mind, that's how that works. The next thing I want to talk about is the set investigation status. We could click one of these hosts and we could set the investigation status to something that's resolved. Now, anything that is resolved means that the host can communicate through the VSRX again. They have additional parameters such as false positive, fixed, ignored for your own information. So you can understand, you can look back and see, okay, that was a false positive, that was fixed. We ignored that one. So that's more for your information, but anything that you set to resolve will take the host off the infected host list. It'll exclude it from it. And then we have set policy override. Now by default, it's set to use configured policy. And you can see that in the policy field for all these hosts, use configured policy. But you could set a host to always include it in the infected host feed or never include it in the infected host feed. That could be something if you know there's a host somewhere that you never want to be able to communicate through the SRX. But probably more useful is the never include host in the infected host feed. And what that can be useful for, if you have an internal server, say that's causing false positives, and you're not really sure how to stop it from causing those false positives. So you could set that server to never include it in the infected host feed. And so you wouldn't have to keep going back through and try to figure out a way to get that server not to trigger the advanced protection mechanisms. And so that's why that's there. Now we can export. What this does is it exports the information, you know, the selected host into a CSV file. And so next let's go ahead and click on a host. We're gonna click on the top host here. We can see the host identifier. We can change that to something a little more user friendly. Say that's a, you know, a DMZ server or something like that. Maybe it's a web server. We can change that and save it. And then we have the host IP. This is the host IP address that it's using. Now the MAC address, that can be available if you're using Policy Enforcer, but we don't have Policy Enforcer set up here, so it's not available. And then the host status. This tells us what the current status of the host is. And we can see here it has a high threat level. So it recommends blocking the host and investigating further. Now whether the host is blocked or not all depends on your threat prevention policy. And we'll get into that in a minute with the JWeb interface since that is configured on the JWeb interface. So you could actually have it set to where we only block 10, which is the highest, and everything else we allow through, or we block something like five and above or whatever. So that's totally up to how that is configured. And then we can see the investigation status. It's currently set to open because we haven't actually looked into this. We have in progress, resolved, false positive, resolved, fixed, resolved, ignored. So there's some different options there. We already talked about the resolved options, but we have in progress that we haven't talked about. And that's more for your own information. Say you have multiple administrators who log in to the Sky ATP GUI here, and it's probably good for them to know if somebody else is looking into a problem. So you can set that to in progress so someone else can see that, okay, somebody's looking into this problem. And then we have the policy override. We already talked about this. And then we have the threat settings. First, we have a time range. This will show us what happened and when it happened. So we can look at this specific events. We can see there was malware hit on May 23rd at 10.57 a.m. And there was another one shortly thereafter, 10.58. Another hit at right after that, you know, 10.58 and two seconds, and then 10.58 and five seconds. So there was a succession of quick malware hits. And then if we look at current threats, we can scroll down and it'll give us more information about the current threats. And we can actually click on the individual threats to find out more information. For example, we can click on the host attempted to download a malicious file. We can select that and it takes us to the files workspace 
for that individual file. And we can see that the host attempted to download this file quite a bit. This is a great segue for the file scanning workspace for HTTP file downloads because that takes us right to that workspace. So we can see here information about that specific file that the host attempted to download. We can see the file name, the type, the, you know, it's executable. We can see signature behavior, signature match, networking information. We can see it's got a high global prevalence. We can see protocols that it was seen was HTTP, how many unique users downloaded this. There's 48. So quite a few downloads for this. And then we can see the threat level set to 10. Uh, when it was last seen was May 23rd, 1058 AM. And there's also additional information, the size, the platform, the type, the strain. And we do have some other details. Now these other details show the hash for SHA-256 and MD5. And so remember I talked about in the whitelist and blacklist, you can use hashing information to whitelist or blacklist a file. This would be that information. Maybe you're downloading something that SkyTP thinks, oh, this is a virus. You know, that's probably not going to happen very often, but it might actually happen. And in that case, you could whitelist the hash. And so you won't have to worry about that file being blocked. And at the bottom, the HTTP download section, we can see all the downloads that happen. The host that downloaded this file, we can see the device that it was attempted to download through, as well as the URL, the destination IP, and things like that. And then we can click on behavior analysis and get a behavior analysis about this type of malware. We can see that it has a high evasion rating, obfuscation as well, some fine-grained behavior, targeting behavior, persistence. So we can scroll down in the section to find out more information about it. Persistence, application error message is muted, obfuscation, binary appears to contain packed or encrypted code, things like that. So you can find out more information about the behavior as well. We look at network activity, and we can see the domains it attempted to contact, contacted IPs, some DNS activity as well, and then the behavior details. And we can find out more information about the behavior under the behavior details. Okay, so let's go back to the full on file scanning workspace. And under HTTP file downloads, we can see the whole list of all files that were downloaded. Now by default, it's only gonna show you threats that were four or greater. You can uncheck that. You can see that some files have been downloaded that weren't malicious, they're rated at one. But then you can see some files were downloaded that were rated at seven to 10, so they were malicious. And you can click on the individual file, and that takes us back to what we saw beforehand. You know, similar to what we saw beforehand. This might be different. I just clicked on a random one, so I don't know for sure. This shows you detailed information about the individual files. And here is the email attachments workspace. And in this workspace, it's going to be very similar to the HTTP file downloads workspace in that it's going to show malicious files that were downloaded, except in this case, through email. Now, I don't have email set up in this environment, so there's not going to be anything present here, but it's going to be very similar to what you saw in the HTTP file downloads workspace. Now the manual uploads workspace, this is a place that you can manually upload files for SkyTP to check. And the results of any of those file scans will appear in this workspace. Then you have the blocked email workspace, which is going to show any SNMTP quarantine or IMAP blocks. And of course, since I don't have the email set up here, there's not gonna be anything here as well as nothing in this IMAP block workspace, but anything that was blocked would show up here as well. And then the telemetry workspace is gonna give you telemetry information, and that is definitely outside the scope of this course, so I'm not gonna go into detail about this. Just keep in mind that telemetry information can be found in this workspace. So let's go ahead and jump back to the JWeb interface and examine a few more Sky ATP related items there. Okay, so here is the JWeb interface. And let's go to the statistics workspace that's under threat prevention. Now this is under monitoring as well. Here we can see some statistics in regards to advanced anti-malware sessions. By default, it's going to show the total sessions. And we can look at this, total sessions permitted, total sessions blocked, and there are no current active sessions. And we can select additional information like HTTP, and we can see more information. We can get rid of total, maybe clear that up a little bit. And we can see here, HTTP sessions blocked, permitted, as well as active. So we can get some additional information. And one thing I do want to bring up here is that even though we just enrolled the VSRX1 device a few minutes ago, I did have it enrolled earlier with this Sky ATP security realm to get this information. So even though we're not sending stuff through right now, there's still additional information that is available. Okay, so the next section, security intelligence session statistics, allows us to look at security intelligence session statistics. 
So first we need to select a profile. And by default, it goes to the feed CNC log only. We didn't configure or have anything set with CNC or nothing was blocked with command and control. So let's go ahead and select infected hosts. And here we can see some additional information. We can select the other checkboxes as well. And we can get some information about infected host total, block drops, and permit. So there's different information you can glean from looking at the different statistics on this page. Okay, so the last thing I do want to cover is the configuration of SkyTP threat prevention policies. And to do that, we need to go to configure, security services, threat prevention, then policies. In here, we can create a threat prevention policy. Now, one is already created, and here you can see and edit the current policies. And so in here, we are blocking CNC servers, anything basically, even minor ones, one through 10 threat levels. Infected hosts, we're blocking seven through 10 and permitting one through six. So that means if a host downloads a file that is rated at a six, we're going to permit it. If it's rated at a seven or eight or nine, we're going to block it. And that's gonna put it on the infected host feed. Remember earlier when we talked about the infected host feed, I did talk about how what gets put on the infected host feed is configured on the VSRX itself. And here, this is where we configure. Uh, malware HTTP, similar type of deal. Malware SMTP, similar type of deal. And then we have logging, which we have currently set to do not log any traffic. And I do want to show you what it looks like to create a new profile. So I just click the create button. We have different profiles. We have CNC profile, infected host profile, malware profile. So we can select these different profiles and we can set, first of all, a score type. Define one threat score per feed. We could define one threat score for multiple feeds or we could just define just one threat score. And that's the default to define one threat score. We had multiple feeds. We could set up different threat scores for different feeds and whatnot. And the rest looks very similar to that as well. So you just you set up the threat score, depending on how you want to configure it with the feeds, and go from there. And then the last thing you need to do is you need to apply this to a security policy rule. And so that's going to be under security policies, rules, and then we expand this rule. We can see that under the advanced security, we have threat prevention policy enabled. So I can edit this for you to show you that. We have the threat prevention policy. You, know, you have to actually select it. This is what it was called. It was called IJSEC TPP. The other thing I do want to point out is that if you are going to be enabling this in a production environment, you are going to want to enable SSL proxy because most web traffic out there is encrypted. And so if you don't enable SSL proxy, it's not going to be able to inspect those encrypted web traffic sessions. And here you can see we do have an SSL proxy configured. And so, Keep in mind, SSL proxy is outside the scope of this course, but SSL proxy is covered in another course inside of the Juniper Education curriculum. So this concludes the demo, which showed many of the features of Sky ETP. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks certification program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.